right you are, but the applause I'll read you the deluge of it. Oh yes I will, well I'll, 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 uh, I'll have to shut up, you see, pretty quickly as soon as it starts. of the Worshipful Company of Mercers. Who presents this noble one? Master Walton, the Worshipful Company of Mercers. The Chamberlain now administers the Freeman's Declaration. I would now invite you to rise and make the Declaration of a Freeman. I, Bernard Law, Viscount Montgomery of Alamein, do solemnly declare that I will be good and true to our sovereign lord, King George VI, that I will be obedient to the mayor of this city, that I will maintain the franchises and customs thereof, and will keep this city harmless in that which in me is, that I will also keep the king's peace in my own person, that I will know no gatherings nor conspiracies <laughs> made against the king's peace, but I will warn the mayor thereof, or hinder it to my power, and that all these points and articles I will well and truly keep, according to the laws and customs of this city, to my power. Would you now please And at the invitation of the Chamberlain, the Field Marshal signs the Roll of Fame, signing under the name of Lord Louis Mountbatten, who, when we last saw, received the honorary freedom here, and the Roll of Fame lies uh, an open book among the rose petals that are scattered according to ancient custom against the plague all over the ta table in front of the Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor sitting back and smiling as Monty... and offering the right hand of fellowship and a copy of the freedom. My lord, in presenting you with a copy of your freedom, it is my proud privilege as Chamberlain to offer you the right hand of fellowship and to greet you as a citizen and mercer of London. historical sword as a token of that sword of honor which has been unanimously voted to you by this honorable court, but which, uh, alas, is still in the hands of the craftsman. May that sword ever serve to remind you of the undying admiration and gratitude of the members of this ancient corporation <coughs> for the outstanding services you have rendered to your king, your country, and the British Commonwealth and Empire. And may it fortify you with the knowledge that you carry with you to the great responsibilities you have now assumed, the unbounded confidence of your fellow citizens of London.
my lords and ladies and gentlemen, I am very deeply conscious of the honour which you have conferred on me today, and I would like to thank the Lord Mayor and Corporation of London for having considered me worthy to be made a freeman of our great capital. I am a London man, I was born in the borough of Lambeth, and I received my education at a great London school, St Paul's School. <laughs> During the war years, thousands of our countrymen passed through London on their way to the front, or to the sea, or on their way back to their homes. You were the springboard for all our adventures, and you were always in the minds of British fighting men all over the world. You were indeed as much part of the fighting effort of our nation as any of the armed services. And we in the army would have been in a very sorry plight if you had failed to win your struggle. But you did not fail. And through all the turmoil of the war, London remained the same. Serene, unconquerable, and never changing. And our soldiers were able to march to victory, confident in the outcome of the battle here at home. <laughs> I often feel that the British soldier did not, uh, perhaps, receive the publicity he deserved during the war. Much was heard, and rightly heard, very rightly, of the great deeds performed by our Empire brothers, and by our allied friends. And the war could not have been won without them. But amongst those in the forefront, I place the unconquerable figure of the British soldier. <laughs> the man who bore the heaviest burden of the war and carried us all to victory. It is to him that I wish to pay a tribute for without his exertions, none of us would be here today. <laughs> now, I feel that the fat bringing, and by his historical tradition, he is British, but with this difference. <coughs> Military training has imposed a certain fixed pattern of behaviour upon him, and he has become disciplined. Without this training, he is undisciplined, because we are not natural soldiers. We, we may hate war, but when we make up our minds, how gallantly we bear ourselves. We do not require the pomp and the ceremony and the slavish discipline of the Germans. We fight the better because we make up our own minds to it. <coughs> and I would remind you of the words of Pericles spoken during the war with Sparta. They toil from early boyhood in a laborious pursuit after courage, while we, free to live and wander as we please, march out, nonetheless, to face the self-same dangers. <coughs> How often do our enemies fail to appreciate this fact? <laughs> These characteristics bring out, I would say, the two main qualities which distinguish the British soldier. His independence and his self-reliance give him the ability to endure hardships. And this quality of endurance results from the superb discipline of the army. This discipline does not consist of a slavish obedience to orders, but is a looser, more rational framework of control in which the soldier's independence can flourish unhindered. We have not always obeyed orders, and we've had our share of bad, indisciplined soldiers. But with few exceptions, the British soldier has behaved admirably. They will vigorously complain of the difficulties of their lives, <laughs> and will appear to the outsider to be hotbeds of discontent and dissatisfaction. <laughs> but this outward grumbling hides an inward stubbornness, a capacity to endure without hope of reward, which is surpassed by none other. 
We can fight longer without success than any other people. Yeah. Let us never forget the debt we owe to the British soldier. Let us pay homage to the man who bears the full weight of modern battle. How often has he stood firm before tyranny and oppression? The last hope of the free world. And in the midst of the noise and confusion of the battlefield, the simple homely figure of the British soldier stands out calm, calm and resolute, dominating all around him by his quiet courage and cheerfulness his unflinching acceptance of the situation. May the ideals for which the British soldier has struggled never vanish from the world, and may he never be forgotten by the nation for which he has fought so nobly. Now I and others like me who have commanded troops, we know to what heights the soldier can aspire. We have seen the greatness of our race proved again 